I was going to do a little preface to this video, and maybe some of you can relate to this, but many years ago, when I was a young man, I was a believer, but I did not know the gospel clear enough. I grew up in a home where they did not clarify the gospel, and all the churches that I went to did not clarify the gospel. So I was suffering a lot of fear, condemnation, and guilt, and I didn't know how to deal with it. So I sought out a lot of people that I perceived to be men of God, and they were typically pastors. And I didn't realize it at the time, but what I was seeking was food and drink that satisfied. I was seeking to be clothed from my nakedness and my shame before God. I was wanting to know that even though I felt like a stranger, I could be invited into the family of God. I wanted to know the clear remedy of dealing with my sickness, which was my sin, and how I could be healed, and I was in a prison of fear, condemnation, and guilt, and I wanted to know how I could ultimately be set free. So I didn't realize it at the time, but because of my spiritual condition, what I was seeking was food and drink. I was seeking to be set free from my prison. I was seeking to be healed from my sickness, which was my sin, and know that I was truly healed and invited in as a stranger. And I needed to be clothed from my nakedness and my shame before God. I needed all of those things as far as spiritual necessity, but I did not even know how to articulate it. I just felt fear and condemnation and guilt. And unfortunately, time and time again, after talking with these pastors, I was always left unsatisfied. I was always left hungry. I always felt naked. I always still felt like I was in my prison and my sickness and my sin was still an issue. And I always felt like a stranger outside that was not invited into the family of God. And with that, I want to get right into this video. Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. Hope your honor day is going good and everything is going well with you. Every once in a while, I'll come back to here to Matthew 25 to explain what this is talking about. This is a battleground proof text for Eastern Orthodox and Catholics who believe this proves a works righteousness salvation. And so they will interpret these passages as though you're saved by your works. Now, there's also a dispensationalist that will interpret this passage by saying that there's these futuristic sinless perfectionist Jews that will be keeping the law perfectly. And when judgment day comes, God will judge them on the basis of their works and then will save them based on the good things that they have done. And I personally think those explanations are dissatisfactory considering the gospel and how a person is saved, which if you're not seeing clearly the light of the gospel and what the gospel provides, you won't be able to understand what these verses are saying, because these verses are talking about what the gospel actually provides. The gospel sets the captive free from prison. The gospel clothes people from their nakedness before God. The gospel is food and drink because it has Christ, and Christ is our food and drink. By his stripes you are healed, and our sinful condition is healed before God when we are sick. In our sin, God heals us before him through the cross. And a part of the gospel is inviting the stranger in to all of these things, to being set free, to being clothed, to being fed, to being healed. And the proper gospel, the true gospel, provides all these spiritual necessities before God. So Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one from another just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. 
Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison? and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me either. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, if you're not careful, you'll make a contradiction in the scripture by thinking that the righteous are people who actually do physical works to make themselves righteous. This is why when some people have trouble interpreting these verses, they push them off to a futuristic group of sinless perfectionist Jews. Or Catholics and Eastern Orthodox say, see, this proves that you're saved by your works and things that you do. And they don't recognize these things as metaphors and shadows and archetypes of the gospel. That the gospel provides all these spiritual necessities that when you're naked, the gospel in it contains the righteousness of God by which we're clothed. It contains Christ by which he is our food and drink. He is also our great physician and our healer so that when you're sick in prison, he's also the one that sets the captive free and invites the stranger in. That's what the gospel provides. And anyone with a false gospel will not provide those spiritual necessities. They can do all these physical outward actions and think that they'll actually be saved by them. And you can see that in the verses down below where they say when did we not do these things and they're shocked because they believe they did these things and they probably very well did these physical actions yet they had a false gospel many of these were probably eastern orthodox and catholics consider this is in matthew 25 while matthew 7 talks about the same group who says haven't we done many wonderful works in your name and he'll say depart from me i never knew you see they believe that their works should have saved them but you can see that it says, but the righteous will go off into eternal life. See, the righteous are righteous independent from works to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accredited to righteousness. So the one who's not working, but believing on Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, which is a non-guilty verdict, that person's faith is accredited to righteousness and the righteous will go off into eternal life. And it's not based on anything they have done not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy, he has saved us. You also consider where it says he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So it says he saved us, so we're already saved in the past tense, and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works. So we're not made holy or saved on the basis of our own works, but purposes of grace. So the righteous will go off into eternal life, and those are believers in Jesus Christ. They have the righteousness of God, Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So the ones who believe and have faith, they have the righteousness of God upon them, which is the gospel, that they're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which should give you a hint of kind of what's going on here in these passages now, as we're going to go ahead and start breaking them down. And you're going to see that what these are, are shadows and archetypes of what the gospel provides, spiritual necessities of what the gospel provides to the one who has believed. So starting again at verse 31, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, I'd like to go more into the sheep and goats. I've done plenty of videos about his sheep and how his sheep will hear his voice. They are given him before the foundation of the world. They will have a personal, individual, effectual calling, and they will be given eternal life and they shall never perish. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one will snatch them out of his hand. I and my father are one. So Jesus says about his sheep that he gives them eternal life and they shall never perish. 
he also says that they will hear his voice. And so then Jesus goes on to say, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Now this is what Paul the apostle taught. Blessed be the God and our father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So according to the scripture, people were chosen before the foundation of the world to inherit the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was prepared for them before the foundation of the world, the ones that were blessed by the Father, which are the sheep, the ones that were given to the Son before the foundation of the world that come to Jesus through the course of the time as they hear his voice, a spiritual inward personal calling by which they will come to Christ and they will be set free, they will be healed, they will be clothed, they will be fed, as they are invited in to be children of God into God's family. So Jesus says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And keep in mind that Jesus' point is, is that if you've done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. Now I've pointed out before that if you don't bring people the real gospel that has the real Christ behind it, you're not providing them food and drink. Because Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus Christ is the eternal bread that the one who eats shall never hunger. They shall never thirst again. See, Jesus in his ministry said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That the one who hungers and thirsts after a right standing with God and for righteousness with him, they will be filled. How are they filled? Well, they're filled through the real gospel, through the real Christ behind the real gospel. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. See, the one who believes in him shall never thirst for righteousness again. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So you can see from the scripture, it teaches that once we have believed in Jesus Christ, we have been filled with righteousness. We shall never hunger and thirst again. Now, there's a lot of people that will deny that. Well, they're not giving you food and drink. They're denying you the food and drink. They're Eastern Orthodox, Catholics, works righteousness people, people that deny that you're saved by grace. They are denying you Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, by which when you eat, you shall never hunger and thirst again concerning righteousness. You have been filled. So I believe these goats are primarily people who are perpetuating false gospels and denying what Jesus Christ actually accomplished, that he is food and drink and clothing, that he is our great physician that heals us by his stripes. We are healed and he is the one that sets us free. Jesus goes on to say, I was a stranger and you invited me in. That's what the gospel does. It proclaims that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a part of his family and you are welcome to eat and drink at his table. If you are a believer in the Son of God, you are welcome to eat and drink and be clothed with the righteousness of God to be set free from your captivity and to be healed before God from your sickness, which is our sin by his stripes we have been healed. He goes on to say, I was naked and you clothed me. Again, this is an essential part of the gospel that without it, you have no gospel at all. That if you do not have that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then you're not giving anybody any clothing. Isaiah 61 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So you can see how righteousness is described as a robe, and we are clothed in the righteousness of God, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference, that we're collectively and equally clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Think of how many times as a believer you've dealt with goats that have actually denied this fact for you. Now, they might have given you some clothes that they had left over in their closet 
to clothe you with. But when it comes to the gospel, they actually will not tell you that you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. They're denying you the essential spiritual necessity. And what would you rather have? The clothing of the righteousness of Jesus Christ or some temporal cloth that will eventually fade away into nothing? Now, what do you think God is interested in the most? Is he interested in the temporal need the most or the spiritual necessity? He's interested in the spiritual necessities, and that's what this is talking about, an eternal righteousness. I was naked and you clothed me. When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it for me. When you have given the gospel that we are made righteous through Jesus Christ by faith, you have done it to the least of these. Now, Jesus isn't teaching that you're saved by giving the gospel. He's teaching that the gospel saves, and he's teaching that there's goats out there that teach false gospels and that actually deny people the spiritual necessities of food and drink, which is Christ, and his eternal righteousness, which is clothing. And they're not inviting them in as a stranger. In fact, they're pushing them out from the family of God. They're trying to cast them out from Christ. They're trying to make it about their works and their performance. And they're not inviting them in as a stranger. They're saying that you have to work for a wage before you come in and you can take part. You know, at the end of the day, when God finally has judgment day, then you'll maybe be allowed to come in and eat once God has weighed the scales and the balances. Jesus is saying, we can come and eat right now. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. We can take part in Christ's righteousness right now and have that eternal gift. How much more will those who receive the abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in this life through the one Christ Jesus? So we reign in this life through the gift of righteousness that we get. And the scripture says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So once we receive that eternal clothing, that robe of righteousness, it's eternal, it's everlasting. And it's a gift, so it's not something that we have to work for. And remember, at the end of this, Jesus says, and the righteous will go off into eternal life. Those who receive the abundant provision, the gift of righteousness, by which they did not have to work for, by which they received it by faith, through the real Christ, through the real gospel, will go off into eternal life. So then the next statement, Jesus says, I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. So what the scripture teaches is that people are imprisoned and that they need to be set free. That's why Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's why we see in Psalms, it says, the Lord executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food for the hungry, who the Lord sets the prisoner free. So the Lord sets the prisoner free and that's through the truth of the gospel. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you'll see in the book of Luke, that's exactly what the gospel does. We see it say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed. So it's talking about the gospel. Notice it says, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim the good news, which is the gospel. The gospel sets the captive free, those that are imprisoned. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, those that are held captive, and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So God is setting free those who are oppressed. He is setting them free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So people are in their own prison of oppression, of fear, guilt, condemnation towards God and the gospel sets them free. See, when we minister the true gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ to people, we do help those who are poor in spirit those who are oppressed and sick and blind, and we give them the message that sets them free. It's the message that sets the prisoner free that a lot of people will deny the actual true gospel, and they'll go around. They'll actually do all these physical actions of giving people food and drink and clothing, and they think that actually saves them, but then they'll actually deny people the real gospel, the spiritual necessities of eternal food and drink, which are Christ and his righteousness and being invited into the family of God and being set free from condemnation and oppression. 
So a false gospel can neither feed people, nor give them drink, nor clothe them, nor can it set them free from their prison, nor help them when they're sick, nor does it actually invite them in to the family of God. Jesus says, I was sick and you visited me, and if you've done it for the least of these, you have done it for me. Now what we do as ambassadors for Christ is tell people how by his stripes we have been healed, that we were sinful before God, sick in our condition, our sinfulness before him, but by his stripes we are healed, that he was crushed for our iniquities, he was wounded for our transgressions, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The ultimate sickness that humanity has suffered like a virus that has started all the way since Adam has been sin, that just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the one man's obedience the many are made righteous. So we see through the one man's disobedience, Adam, the many became sinners. We all became sinners through Adam's transgression. It was like a virus that spread down like a sickness. But by his stripes we have been healed, and through Christ's obedience the many are made righteous. See, the scripture talks about how he was obedient all the way to the point of death. And by the one man's obedience the many are made righteous. So we are made righteous, not through our personal obedience, but through Christ's obedience, up unto death, the death of the cross, by which God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that there was a divine transaction where God took upon our sin, the one who knew no sin, he was tempted at all points, yet without sin became sin for us, us who could not do anything good. There's none who do good. There's none who do anything righteous. Those that could not do anything righteous in and of themselves, God gave them his righteousness. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Those that could not do anything righteous received the righteousness of God, and the one who could not sin took upon our sin. So when Adam was disobedient, there was an affliction of sin that spread throughout the entirety of humanity, just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners. Through his disobedience there was an affliction of sin upon the entire humanity, but through Christ he is the remedy, he is the cure, and by his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So having got this far, you should see what's happening here. These are shadows and archetypes of what the gospel provides, and these people, in this goat and sheep judgment, some of the people are mistakenly thinking that it is about their works, because they're like, when have we not visited you in prison? When have we not clothed you when you were naked? When did we not feed you when you were hungry and thirsty? These are people that probably spent their life doing these works. And now they're perplexed why Jesus isn't rolling out the red carpet for them. Because they're the same people in Matthew 7 who are saying, But Lord, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? They believe that they should be saved and justified on the basis of their works. There are people that had false gospels like Eastern Orthodox and Catholics and works righteousness people. They denied people the real gospel and in denying the people the real gospel, they denied them the actual food and drink and the clothing and being invited in, visiting them in prison or when they're sick. See, they're not providing the spiritual necessities that the gospel actually provides. They're denying those things in their gospel. In their gospel, they'll actually deny the eternal food and drink and clothing. All these spiritual necessities are denied in their false gospel. Only the real gospel provides these things where you're clothed before God, where you have an eternal food and drink, where you're healed from your sickness and where you're set free from your prison. See, he goes on to say, Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which was been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? See, they're perplexed. 
A lot of these people probably spent their life like Mother Teresa doing these works and now is very confused that they're not being saved on the basis of their wonderful works. But Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? And what does he say to those people in Matthew 7? Depart from me, you who practice iniquity, I never knew you. See, he says, depart from me, you who practice iniquity. These people appealing to their works, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, this is what Eastern Orthodox and Catholics teach, that you're justified by your works. That if you did these works, and if you didn't look at these as shadows and archetypes as metaphors to the gospel, then you'll look at these as actual physical works and believe that you're saved and justified by your works. Like the people in Matthew 7 who say, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? But he says to them, depart from me, you practice iniquity, I never knew you. That's because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Only through the law comes the knowledge that you're a worker of iniquity, and you will not be justified by your works. So like much of the Bible, this is cryptid and coded in such a way that it traps the works righteousness and their false gospel heresy. And they'll run to passages like this and say, see, you are saved by the works that you do. But they don't understand that these are shadows and archetypes and metaphor of what the gospel actually provides to people. The things they actually deny in their works righteousness. They deny that Jesus Christ is eternal food and drink and that he's eternal clothing of righteousness. In doing so, they're not inviting people into the family of God nor helping them when they're sick or imprisoned. Their false gospel does none of that. Even though they might be providing temporal needs, they're denying people the eternal spiritual necessity that is of most importance. So you have to understand, too, this is not saying that you're saved by getting out and giving the gospel. It's teaching that the gospel is saves and that there'll be people on the day of judgment with false gospels and true gospels. And the people with false gospels will be very confused because they did these works all their life and feeding people and clothing people and giving them drink. But as they did that, they told those, those people that you were justified by your works as well. And they did not actually give them the eternal clothing and righteousness and drink of Christ. See, imagine that you could go to a false gospel church, like a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. You go to those people and they'll give you these physical necessities of food and drink and clothing and things like this. But they'll completely cut you off from Christ as spiritual eternal food that satisfies an eternal righteousness that is clothing. They will cut you off from truthful considerations of the gospel that will cause conceptualizations by which you will be set free. They will cut you off from those. And they will cut you off from conceptualizations to understand that you are healed before God from your sin, that that's no longer an issue, that by his stripes we have been healed. So when Jesus is speaking to these goats, he's speaking to them through the lens and the shadows and archetypes of what the gospel has provided, that I was hungry and thirsty and naked and a stranger and sick and in prison, and you did not help me. Because if you did not do it for the least of these, you did not do it for me either. So I believe this is primarily people that held to a false gospel that probably spent the better time of their life doing these works and actions as far as feeding and clothing people. But like a Mother Teresa say, but then actually cut people off from Christ who is spiritual necessity and abundance of food and drink and clothing of righteousness. And they doctrinally deny people the gospel of Jesus Christ, which provides all these spiritual necessities and abundance. So I hope this was a helpful explanation, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Peace to you. Take care and hope your night or day is going good. God bless.